Welcome to what could very well be the most exciting or interesting Victoria 3 video you're going to watch this week. They've revealed all the changes coming to historical immersion, diplomacy, warfare and more. These are the sweeping changes that will be coming to the first major update in Victoria 3. We don't know when that will be, but man alive, do we know what's coming. Please do consider liking and or subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate the insane support recently. Thank you so much if you've become one of us. Without mucking about though, let's jump in and talk about the big changes coming soon to Victoria 3. First up, it's warfare. And this one, my goodness, this is probably the most controversial, at least it seems like it, from a recent poll on my channel. Warfare is very simple in Victoria 3, almost to the point where the AI can control it. However, I have argued, and not always to the pleasure of a lot of people on the internet, that the system as it stands is actually fairly well polished. It works as well as the rest of them, if not better. The AI, at least, is very good at controlling it. In fact, so much so, you might be better off to just let them do it. And that is arguably part of the problem. Let's have a look then. What's changing in warfare mode of Victoria 3? In the developer's diary, they say that the military system is different and that they don't intend to revert back towards a more tactical system. It suffers from interface woes, however, that could do with some deepening, increasing player control in specific areas. They have given us this list of a few things that they plan to expand. And so, of course, here it is again at the bottom right of your screen in a little bit of an easier way to read it and understand it. Let's talk about what they're actually going to do. First up, they want to address some of the rough edges in how generals function, such as, for example, improving unit selection for battles and balancing the overall progression along fronts. The key here for me is improving unit selection for battles. It can be quite challenging to separate battalions or units out among your generals, and the system does need some improvement. Again, at the moment, it feels a little too automated in that regard, at least for me. Next, they are going to add the ability for countries to set strategic objectives for their generals. Again, this feels like another win for me. Another ability for us as players to actually have generals say, for example, I don't know if this will be the case, but... An obvious one that comes to mind could be something like defending a territory, preventing coastal invasions, maybe aggressively pushing blitzkrieging a front line. I don't know. There are plenty of options, and I hope that some of those come through. Thirdly, they want to increase the visibility of navies and make admirals easier to work with. Uh, again, I mean, the navy's incredibly important, right? Great Britain wasn't just a land power. It was their navy that you really should have feared. And so having a more important role for the Navy in Victoria 3 will be better. Here, they're talking more about how visible it is. That also matters. There's very little on the map that shows you when a naval invasion is being carried out. I usually just hover over the Admiral to see how long it's taking. So it would be nice if we could see that play out a little bit more in an animated way on the map. Fourthly, they want to improve the ability of players to get an overview of their military situation. More data like the underlying numbers behind battle scenes. The battle scenes, which you can see at the moment, by the way, as I'm playing a very minor power by the name of Texas. I'm going to show you, sort of, how to win your independence, and then maybe build up a little bit of an economy. It's some fascinating gameplay. Um, I'd encourage you to watch along, but of course it's not the focus here. However, it is important, of course, we were thinking about data in underlying battles. We'll know more as players. Always good. Uh, fifthly, finding solutions for the issue where theatres can split into multiple, sometimes dozens of tiny fronts as pockets are created. This is a technical issue. You may have lost a war in Victoria 3 because your theatres split in crazy ways. Hopefully they'll get on top of that. And then finally, they want to experiment with controlled front splitting for longer fronts. Um, again, this feels like another somewhat necessary move. If you're fighting in a big country, maybe like the Americas or Russia or something like that, you can end up with snaking difficult front lines. Both of those final adjustments look to either fix the front lines or give us a little bit more player control. My hot take on this is probably these military improvements, if enacted successfully, will do a really good service to Victoria 3. Is it a political and economic simulator at its heart? Absolutely. Should warfare play an important role in the historical context? Absolutely. So it needs to offer something more to the players. It seems to be the most sticking point. However, speaking of historical immersion, the next thing that they talked about was adding more historical immersion to the historical sandbox that is Victoria 3. Let's take a look. Historical immersions. 
at a high level, they're going to restore more historical accuracy and try and prevent some of that immersion breaking while also keeping alt histories somewhat plausible. Delving into the detail, you can see in their statement they do make a specific point here to mention that Victoria 3 quote is a historical sandbox rather than a strictly historical game. We still want players to feel as though historical events unform and there's a plausible alt history. However, immersion has been a problem. So let's take a look at the ways that they're going to try and fix historical immersion in Victoria 3 without perhaps pulling too far away from the design philosophy again. The first point is around the American Civil War. Many of my viewers are American, so I'm sure this one feels much closer to home for you than me. The American Civil War has a decent chance to happen. Happens in a way that makes sense. Uh, here they iterate that slave states rising up to defend slavery, etc. And isn't easily avoidable by the player. At the moment, it's somewhat easily avoidable and maybe just doesn't happen. So they're going to try and code that in, in a little bit more of a hardline way to ensure that it happens more often than not kind of thing. Secondly, they want to tweak content such as the Meiji Restoration, uh, Alaskan Purchase, and so on, in a way that can, uh, quote, more frequently be successfully performed by the AI through a mix of AI improvements and content tweaks. Uh, so here we're given a few different examples. We're given the Meiji Restoration, Japan, the Alaskan Purchase, of course, when it was purchased off the Russians, uh, and all sorts of other, I'm sure, somewhat minor but still significant historical events from a variety of different countries. They're going to try and bring them in so that they can be successfully performed by the AI. Here we sort of get a hint that it's not that these things necessarily don't exist, but rather that they're just not being used properly, well enough, or frequently enough. And that's kind of a theme with a lot of the earlier changes. However, some of the later points on this list give a slightly different look. Thirdly, they want to work to expose and improve content such as expeditions and journal entries. They're currently too difficult for players to find or to complete. Finding them can be problematic uh, on the journal entries, which are, if you don't know, kind of like these sort of quests or uh, historical storylines or maybe ahistorical storylines that you can push through to expand your nation or reform your nation, that kind of thing. Here they want to make it so that these entries are both easier for us to find. Hopefully they're talking about future entries, not existing ones. I want to know my possibilities rather than just what I've got now, personally. And next, make it slightly easier to complete some of them. They are pretty hardcore in a lot of ways. You'll be playing as like a minor South American nation and your journal entry will be to like colonize the Nile or something, you know, like <laughs> we could maybe use some at different levels, I think. At least that's my experience. Fourthly, they want to ensure that unifications, such as three big ones, Italy, Germany and Canada, don't constantly happen decades ahead of historical schedule. And they want to increase the challenge of unifying Germany again and Italy in particular. Uh, these ones are pretty interesting. Unifications of Italy, Germany and Canada in my game experience have happened quite frequently and fairly early. Canada by far and away seems to always happen for me. Uh, I did read in the comments recently though that people don't see Germany happening a lot. So I don't know, maybe that's up to you. The second part, of course, is how interesting uh, it will be to see whether the challenge of unifying both Italy and Germany increases in difficulty and by how much by. We don't yet know. We'll have to see. Uh, the last tweak coming to historical immersion, uh, fairly general, but actually could make a massive difference. General AI tweaks to have AI countries play in a more believable and immersive way. This is, in a nutshell, <laughs> the problem, right? In a nutshell, that's what it is and it looks like they're hoping to address it. For me, the big takeaway from this section is bringing more historical events codified into the game so they're more likely to happen, and then secondly, helping the AI get a hold of that. The journal entries as well, by the way, will be really nice if it's executed properly. So I'm looking forward to seeing how all of those play out, and of course, the corresponding changes that this will have on things like interest groups and national politics. Here I am playing around with the Texan politics. I'm sure you maybe haven't seen this government screen before. Hopefully not. It'll get a little bit spicier as we move through as well. And every single damn interest group decides to create their own political party. Anyway, moving swiftly along, the third area of four was diplomacy. Again, another pretty big one. Let's take a look at what they've got to offer. And even though it's pretty hard to say, I reckon these could be the most significant changes of all, actually, because diplomacy impacts everything. Taking a deep dive, you see that the third area that they're looking to improve is diplomacy. They think that what they uh, have here already is quite good and in no need of significant redesign. 
However, they do think it's an area that could do with deepening and, crucially, providing more options to players to add to diplomatic plays and diplomacy. These are going to be fairly big. The first one and second one in particular, let's take a look. Add reverse swaying, the ability to offer to join a side in a play in exchange for something else. We really do need more abilities to be able to join diplomatic plays. Here we have a reverse sway option. I'd like to give a little bit more detail about the second point here though. Add the ability to expand your primary demands in a war. This is massive, beyond just one war goal. If you don't know, what happens at the moment basically is you press a goal, a war goal, that enacts a diplomatic play. It starts to play out. Your primary war goal might be to take one territory. Let's say it's Texas, for <laughs> simplicity's sake. And then you may have other war goals that you add in afterwards. Uh, hey, I don't just want to take Texas. I also want to take three other states. And I want to force you to open your market. That's all fine and good. However, there's a really unintended consequence where at the moment, where the AI pieces out before war breaks out, right? If they choose to back down to your threats and diplomatic play, they only cede your primary war goal and then you're peace locked with them. You're in a truce for an extended period. I think it might be 12 months off the top of my head. Either way, having just one primary war goal ceded to you and then being peace locked is a disaster, especially if you're looking to expand in a certain direction. What they're doing here is effectively giving the ability to add more primary demands. That way, if they want to back down, they'll have to cede all primary demands to you and not just the first thing that you clicked on when you initiated the diplomatic play. This is a big change, very necessary. Thirdly, they'll have more things to offer in diplomatic plays. The example that they give is that we'll be able to give away our own land. This is massive as well. Ceding territories peacefully is something that is missing in Victoria 3. You either have to take them, colonize them. Yeah, there are a few different options, but we need better ways to be able to negotiate and trade territory. Again, a little bit of a callback maybe to the Alaskan purchase event. Fourthly, they'd like to also adjust trading, or at least giving away trading states. This is kind of an extension of what we talked about before with the third points of giving away our own land, but here, of course, we'll be able to directly trade states with another party. You give me Alaska, and I don't know, I'll give you Hawaii or something. <laughs> Moving along, foreign investment and some form of construction in other countries will also become an option, at least if they're part of your playable market. This is neat. At the moment, you can kind of bankroll people as major powers, right? Britain could bankroll Texas, for example, give them some extra uh, influence. But outside of that, there isn't really much you can do. It would be wonderful to see a system where we can invest and construct in other countries, at least in some form. Finally, though, here, at least in this section, they want to improve and expand on interactions with and from subjects. I'm your British overlord and you are my subject. Allow me to engage with you in different ways, is essentially what's being said here. Uh, the examples that they give are being able to grant and ask for some autonomy through a diplomatic action, for example. All very cool things that will help reform the diplomatic system in some way. And now let's take a look at the final section, the sort of awkward other. Although you shouldn't necessarily just think, oh, these are crap because they're other. It's just they maybe don't necessarily have a place. Maybe you might say laws. Pops. I don't know. Here is a list of what they are improving. And you can tell from their statement that, it, again, it is those things like population, standard of living, revolutions, uh, loyalty, radicals, and the late game economy and AI, too. It's got a lot in it. Let's unpack it. First up, they want to make it easier to get an overview of our pops and pop factors. This matters for all sorts of things. Uh, the three big ones that come to mind are your population's needs. You'll notice my standard of living, if you haven't seen it before, it's up the top left. At the moment, it's 7.1. It's that little bowl icon next to the uh, literacy. <laughs> it's really important. Their standard of living matters a lot. Also, their needs. What do different groups need and how can you appease those groups? If you want a society, for example, that's governed by the rich, then you need to make sure that you're meeting that specific population sector's needs. You might also want to look into different population groups like farmers or something to try and appease them better. Having more information about needs, standard of living, and then the third section in this part, radicals and loyalists, will make a big deal to player decisions and agency. Hopefully they can present this information in a way that's easy or relatively easy for us to understand. All of it though is focused on populations, right? On stability, on the needs of your people. 
something that is somewhat hidden, I think, in Victoria 3. Secondly, they want to experiment with autonomous private sector construction and increase the differences in gameplay between different economic system. Uh, two big points. So on the first one, autonomous private sector construction, that means that effectively the private sector in your economy would be able to build and construct things to produce goods or services without you having to directly initiate that order. That seems pretty important. Providing, of course, that we know who's in the private sector, how big it is. Again, kind of relating back to that first point around POPs and their needs and standard of living. The next part here is uh, increasing the differences in gameplay between different economic systems. That's largely bound to laws at the moment. Uh, although in brackets here they say, quote, though, as I've said many times, we're never going to take construction entirely out of the hands of the player. So there'll still be that ability for us to set the construction of the game. Of course, it's a big part. You'll see buildings play a massive role in the economy, and we do need to have that agency. Hopefully, the balance will be struck just right. We'll have to wait and see if it lands in that Goldilocks zone. Uh, the third major point in the other section is ironing out some of the kinks with the late game economy and the AI's ability to develop key resources like oil and rubber. Again, that's the late game economy. So perhaps that's one example of how the AI interacts with it. They don't go into much detail about how they might iron out some kinks for us in our own player managed late game economy though. So I can't really delve into any more detail there. And then the fourth and final point in the other section is to make it more interesting and, quote, competitive, end quote, but also more challenging to play in a more conservative and autocratic style. A lot of nations, of course, start with more conservative and autocratic styles, and many will see a push through the Victorian era for greater liberalization and that kind of thing. However, of course, this is a big old world, and there are many different cultures and beliefs playing out within it. It will be very interesting to see if they can add both more interest, but also a more competitiveness to the modes. And crucially though, I think the big takeaway is that they're gonna make it more challenging to play in the autocratic style, which at the minute is, as you can imagine, fairly easy. How they choose to make it more challenging will have a big impact though. Will it be that people are more likely to revolt against you? Or will they feed into some of the other things that they're tweaking around diplomacy and, and the military? We'll have to wait and see. That is it for the big changes. Let's now have a look at a couple of things that they teased at the end and their closing thoughts, because I think that shares a lot of information about where it's heading and what they're thinking. And we also get a little look at how some of these changes might feel. Here you can see a change that they've teased, work in progress about governments and legitimacy. If you have powers or parties in control that are legitimate and that have the will of the people behind them, this will have a more significant impact. You can see they've broken up government legitimacy into different sections and they're providing more information about what's affecting it, what it's due to, and the impacts that it has on us. Nice to see, and maybe that'll fit in more broadly with their design changes. In their final closing thoughts, they issue some important information. Let's go through it. They say that the list that I've just covered in this video and that they shared in the development diary isn't an exhaustive list of everything that they want to do. They also mention that this stuff might not necessarily even make it into the first few patches. We've of course had one patch already, it was a small update, added a few different things, changed the impacts of government wages, fixed some bugs. I covered it in a video yesterday if you want the information. And we will expect more major patches to come in future. They go on to say that they will of course read and take our feedback into account, plans around the near future, and they remind us that everything mentioned in this update, it will be part of their quote, free post-release patches. So of course these changes to the base game aren't going to have a price tag associated with them. Uh, if they did, that would be pretty wild. Uh, at some point they'll say we'll start to talk about our plans for expansions but not any time soon. They conclude by saying, quote, what I can promise you though is that we're going to strive to keep you informed and do our best to give you insight into the post-release development process with dev diaries, videos, and streams, just like we did before the game was released. I'll return next week as we start covering the details of the work that we're doing for our post-release patch. See you then, end quote. As you would expect, more work to be done, more content to come from them, and of course, more content to come from me too. That concludes this video. A whole load of sweeping changes coming across Victoria 3, not just in the first big patch, but really more broadly the development life cycle of some 
patches to come in future and probably some time before they all release. I think that these are good changes. I personally can't fault many of them. Of course, it all depends on how they're executed. And for that, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'm Jumbo Pixel. I won't harass you to like and subscribe if you've watched this far and you're one of the best. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me anyway. And I'll see you next time for all sorts of stuff, including loads more Victoria 3. Take care.